But before we really start, I'd like to say a word about this terrible attack in Manchester. I think that you remember uh, what has happened there. Uh, every minute there are more deaths. So this is terrible times, uh, probably everywhere around the world. Some things like this can happen. And uh, well, let's remember uh, the, 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 those who have died, among them are also children of all ages. Uh, so, yeah, just a minute of, uh, of uh, remember this uh, terrible situation. But let me introduce now the, the two speakers. First, uh, the first one, Rick Levin. Rick Levin is the chief executive officer of Coursera. He has a great academic history. He has completed a 20-year term as president of Yale. So he knows the university very well. He, has named, he was named to the Yale faculty in 1974 and spent two decades teaching there, conducting research, serving on committees, and working on, on the administration of the university, where he made a big change. He also served as President Obama Council of Advisors of Science and Technology. He's director of American Express and C3 Energy. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Sciences and the Academic Philosophical Society. He got a bachelor's degree in, from Stanford in history. He studied politics and philosophy at Oxford, and he earned, <coughs> where he earned a Bachelor of Letters. He got a PhD from Yale and holds honorary degrees from Harvard, Princeton, Oxford, and Peking universities. So we are excited to hear today with all your experience how you see the future of digital education. Please. Good morning. Um, let me <clears throat> join Carlos in offering, especially to our British colleagues, uh, condolences on the tragedy that occurred last evening. This is just another one of these terrible episodes in this difficult times in which we live. And um, let's hope that we, that we as educators can continue to bring enlightenment that will diminish violence and terror throughout the world. So 2012, five years ago, that was the year of the MOOC, so proclaimed the New York Times. Uh, it, there was a tremendous amount of uh, hyperbolic discussion about the effects of massive online learning at scale, how it was going to transform the educational system as we knew it. Predictions were made, some of them right here at the first eMOOCs conference, at, but all over, the, all over the world, some of the early uh, players in this game were, were talking about the end of the university as we know it. You know, in 10 years, there will be no more uh, bricks and mortar. Uh, some crazy ideas that were clearly exaggerated uh, at the time, but nonetheless did cause, uh, you know, considerable consternation in our university communities. Was, was this thing that we ourselves have, are creating going to eventually be the demise of the um, of the four-year undergraduate or three-year undergraduate program and of graduate and professional degrees, um, it's it's five years. We're, we're five years in, and I would say we have delivered on some of the early promises, if not on the hy if not on the hyperbole. Among the early promises were one that we could extend the reach and visibility of our university brands, and that that would be a way to also widen and broaden the social mission of the university by reaching wider audiences and educating many who did not have access to high quality university experiences. And we also thought, and, and many of you are particularly interested in this, that this was, this was going to be an opportunity for really substantial pedagogical innovation with large numbers of learners online at scale. There would be tremendous opportunity to advance pedagogy. Well, five years later, we've, uh, we, we've, we've got some good results. Um, according to data from Class Central at the close of last year, 
There were 58 million registered learners on various MOOC platforms around the world. That's, that's more than 10% of the total of, of university graduates in the world. Uh, over 700 universities were offering content and nearly 7,000 courses were offered uh, on, the, on the entire collective of MOOC um, platforms. That's a pretty impressive record. Um, and, it, and we did learn quite a bit from it, as we hoped. First, we learned something about the structure of courses and what works online. The presumption that what works in the campus classroom would work in the online classroom was quickly proven wrong. Uh, when, when Coursera and edX launched early on, virtually all the courses were full semester length, you know, 10 or 13 week courses which, of course, led to completion rates that were pathetically low. And we learned through iteration and experimentation that shorter courses, even if they just mean you have to chop up a semester-length course into pieces, uh, work much better in terms of retention and completion. Um, we learned that when you're operating at scale, machine grading can take you only so far, and we had to discover other ways to assess qualitative assignments, written work, uh, longer computer coding exercises and things of that sort. And what we discovered was um, the peer grading, for example, actually did pretty well. And that if an instructor set good rubrics, you could actually get reasonable results through employing the learners themselves to assist in the learning experience. And in fact, that the, the practice of peer grading is regarded by learners as one of the big pluses of an online course experience, experience. Today we're moving in the direction of artificial intelligence, using artificial intelligence to give, to give learners hints, to give them suggestions, to tell them what sections of prior material to go back and review if they fail a quiz. Um, we're in the most primitive stages of testing these AI bots to intervene in the learning process, but I think there's a tremendous future ahead in that. So if you look at the original proposition, the value proposition given to universities, MOOCs will expand your reach and visibility, broaden your audience, and increase your social impact, and lead to pedagogical innovation. I think it's fair to say that we're delivering, more or less, on all three of those, uh, of those directions. Um, but what we didn't anticipate, I think, is the real implications of opening up university content to a broad audience of people well beyond their university years. Um, all of the early talk talked about teaching courses as if the, the object of education were the same 18 to 22 year olds that we teach on our campuses, or, or perhaps people later in life getting access to those interesting academic materials. But what I want to argue today is that actually we have learned something. We've learned something that, uh, about the biggest impact of MOOCs so far, and it's not about transforming the university. How many of your universities have fewer students today than you did five years ago? How many have smaller faculties? Okay. How many employers do you think in the world are looking at MOOC credentials when they assess a candidate for a job? Well, it's a lot. And that's the, that's the transformation that's actually occurred. We have not disrupted, not yet, the education market. We've disrupted the labor market. Because there's a tremendous need out there for lifelong learning of skills that are relevant to people's careers. The Economist recognized this in a cover story earlier this year when it pointed to the fact, well-known facts, that the nature of work is changing, has been, it's, it's always been changing since the Industrial Revolution of the 18th century, but it's changing particularly rapidly in, the, in this digital era where, where the need to acquire new skills simply to keep current in your, in your profession or occupation is, in, is increasingly salient. Where obsolescence of many jobs and many skills is happening at a faster pace than ever before. 
so that the need to continue to reskill and upskill and even retrain to an entirely different career is, is, uh, is of increasing prominence and will continue to increase as the artificial intelligence revolution takes hold in the decades ahead. The average millennial is estimated to take between 13 and 15 different jobs over a working lifetime. That's a lot more than one generation ago. And it makes a difference because people, those people demand and want in their jobs, they want opportunities for professional development because they know that they have to keep on learning. It's also the case that, that as technology changes, there are extraordinary transformations in the nature of jobs that are in demand. Um, the so-called skills gap is, uh, is, a, is very much a reality. In a world with still, in many parts of the world, very high uh, areas, you know, very significant unemployment, we nonetheless have, for example, a quarter of a million data science jobs in the U.S. Uh, alone that will go unfilled five years from now uh, if we don't do something about it. There's literally hundred, a couple hundred thousand open jobs in data science right now. Um, it's, it's estimated that by the end of this decade, there'll be two million jobs open for cybersecurity uh, experts. Um, and, and altogether, globally, by 2020, it's expected there'll be 40 million jobs that are uh, that require university education, uh, 40 million more jobs than there will be university graduates. So certain, certain skills are very much in demand even in a period in which there's considerable uh, unemployment. And so what we see is that instead of our, what we may have expected at the beginning, a focus on the traditional university student, someone age 18 to 22, or maybe age 22 to 28 or 30 in, in graduate school, um, th uh, we're looking at a very different type of learner. Um, the 18 to 22 year old needs to learn how to think and how to adapt to new knowledge. They need to, learn, need to learn critical thinking skills. They need to learn in person, in a classroom, maybe with, with blended learning and, and other types of technology involved. But a big part of the experience is a, is a residential cohort with, which they, with whom they live for three or four years uh, and develop personally as well as intellectually over that time. The lifelong career learner, by contrast, is typically 25 to, 20 to 45 years old, and these people need to learn new skills in computing and data science and business, new frameworks and techniques for business, uh, new languages. They need to learn to write better, to speak better, to present better. Um, they learn everywhere, not just in the classroom. They learn on the job, at home, uh, in their leisure time, and on the move increasingly using mobile devices. So let's look at what the MOOC and online learning in general is doing to address this problem. First of all, we have attributes that are exactly what the lifelong learner needs. We have massive scale and affordability. Um, the, the credentials that we offer, at least the, the platforms you're hearing about at this conference, such as edX and FutureLearn and Coursera, we offer these credentials either for free or at very low prices. Um, uh, second, the, these platforms are flexible. They fit into the learner's own cadence of time and when, when, and, when and where they have time to study. We're all working very hard to improve our mobile platforms so that the learner can actually experience a course, do have a course experience anywhere, on the, on, on the, uh, you know, on the subway, on the way to work, as well as at home uh, on their desktop uh, at their leisure. Um, and, what we're, and what lifelong learners are earning for this effort are, are essentially becoming a labor market currency, the micro-credential, the Coursera or, or, uh, or edX uh, certificates, um, are definitely gaining currency with employers uh, throughout the world. Um, we're doing this at massive scale. Um, to, to talk about the three things I just mentioned, scale, Coursera has over 26 million learners now. 
We have over, we've had over 107 million course enrollments. Our learner population, like I was suggesting, is different from the typical learner population in a university. 89% of our learners are over age 22, and 45% are from emerging economies. The, 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 we, we have global reach, unlike any single university ever. Um, you put your courses on a platform like Coursera or Future Learner or edX, and it will, it will reach the world. Um, with, in Coursera's case, 8 million learners in North America, nearly as many in Asia and in Europe, and growing numbers in Latin America and Africa. On per capita basis, Australia is not bad either, but as you can see from the chart. Um, th the flexibility is really interesting. The opportunities that the, that the ease of access to education creates. This young woman is a, is works f um, is a school teacher in the United States, and she and she works uh, on a project that's really one of my favorite things that I've encountered in my time at Coursera. There's a company in China called VIP Kid, started by uh, by a woman who herself did not complete high school but she's passionate about the education of Chinese school children, and she believes that the best way to give them a leg up is for them to really learn English from an elementary school level on, onward. And so she uses American school teachers, American and Canadian school teachers, to, to connect to Chinese school children for two 45-minute sessions each week over the internet. They have, the students have online learning materials, they do it, they prepare in advance, and then they go over the material with these North American teachers and learn English along the way. Now, it's great, it's a, it, this business has grown from employing 300 teachers to 12,000 teachers in the span of a year and a half. Uh, I call it the Uber for American school teachers. It's employing uh, school teachers after work um, and giving them substantial supplemental incomes, just like Uber drivers uh, are able to earn for themselves. And what's the, what's the point here? Th uh, this is a, th here's a, here is a, uh, oh, well, and where does Coursera come in? This, the school teachers all take the Arizona State sequence in teaching English as a second language to train them for this, for this task. So this is an example of a, of a woman who's working off hours at a second job and finding the time to fit in um, training as, as uh, in the teaching of English as a second language. It's just a new way of thinking about how one gets educated. Um, I mentioned the value of our mobile devices. 40% um, of Coursera lear learners use mobile at some point, some combination of mobile and desktop, and uh, about a quarter use mobile only. <clears throat> um, we talked about scale, talked about flexibility, the credentials themselves. Um, some of you may recall that Coursera did a study published in the Harvard Business Review in September of 2015 in which we demonstrated that 80, in that study, 87% uh, of those seeking career advancement on the Coursera platform said that they had received benefits in their career from taking these courses. Um, we, we, des we decided we're going to keep doing that study, and so every Coursera learner who completes a course today gets an email six months later with a survey asking them to tell us what the impact of their, courses ha of their course has been on their career. It's, the results are still holding up. 84% report a career benefit. But here's the astonishing thing. 30% report a material benefit. That is to say they got a promotion, a raise, started a new job, or started a business. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty staggering number, and what, the, what you probably can't read too well at the bottom of this chart is that um, the, the more disadvantaged the learner, the more the benefit. So in the case of learners with no college education, from low socioeconomic status, from an emerging economy, 48% of those learners report a material benefit from these online courses. So the micro-credentials are definitely delivering impact to people's lives. And employers are finding them valuable too. This is an amazing uh, study recently published in uh, interview.io. 
a, a, a magazine for human resource professionals, uh, online, online magazine. Um, and the, 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 the question was, what are the best predictors for software engineers of performance on a job interview? You have to know that software engineers are actually made to do a programming exercise when they go for, to get a job. So, years of experience, whether you had a master's degree, um, whether you founded a startup, these had no impact at all. Whether you went to a top school, that had some impact. Whether you had worked in a top company, that had also significant impact. But far and away, the strongest predictor was have you taken a course recently I'm sorry to have to do branding here, but have you taken a course recently on Coursera or Udacity? And, and, uh, and that was the strongest predictor. Now, before you panic about the value of, your own edu of the educations your schools are offering, if you came from a top school, the incremental value of the Coursera or Udacity course was nil. But if you didn't come from a top school, it was completely dispositive. It was by far, it was overwhelmingly the, the strongest predictor. Pretty strong evidence, I, I, you know, it's one study, but, it's, but I, we're, we're hearing more and more how the micro-credentials are playing a significant role in people's lives. And increasingly, em employers are saying, yes, they pay attention to them, they hire to them, they look, they, they are likely to consider micro-credentials, they uh, appreciate seeing it, the credentials are, are uh, being posted, you know, on LinkedIn and other job websites, and, and, they ha and that, like I said, have become a labor market currency. So we are having an impact. It isn't exactly the impact we expected when we started uh, five years ago, but it's a powerful one, and it's addressing a very important social need. And if I may say so, it's making our universities more relevant. And, and, and giving our universities even greater salience and public importance and significance at a time, like all times, when funding is jeopardized, when, when governments are not as always as supportive as they need be. But now you can tell them you're not only educating the young, you're solving the skills gap problem. So I think, it, I think there's many collateral benefits of, of this somewhat surprising outcome of the MOOC revolution. Now, we are working beyond universities to close the skill gaps. Um, what, what we've discovered at Coursera, and I know some of the other platforms are, are, are doing the same thing, is beginning to reach learners not just as individuals in, in, in what they call in Silicon Valley the B2C marketplace, but we're reaching people um, through their workplace or through government programs. Um, Coursera has sort of three modes uh, one is individuals can come on to the uh, website and, and purchase essentially group licenses so that their work group at work can take courses together. Or we can go through human resource um, departments and contract with employers. Or we can go to government workforce development programs or nonprofits that administer them and, and sell them essentially uh, an enterprise offering of a set of courses uh, for their training programs. Um, employers realize they need to do this. It's not just, it's not just the employees. So, um, and, and you see it sort of from two perspectives. We did a survey of learners in the United Kingdom and found that only 14% of young professionals really felt satisfied with the training options that their employer was providing them. And, and nearly 40% um, you know, felt that, um, that their own skills were becoming less relevant in their careers and that they had a pressing need for training, particularly in management and digital skills. And you know, some 43% of companies um, reported in a recent survey, actually, uh, actually this is a year ago, that they feel comfortable incorporating MOOCs into their learning and development programs. And I think that number is going to grow very quickly. Um, in August of last year, we launched officially Coursera for Business, um, and we actually have now about uh, over 50 enterprise customers, businesses that are using, uh, they're using Coursera in the workplace to train employees. And the use cases vary across the spectrum of, of a, a, a wider spectrum of our courses than you might imagine. Obviously, business school courses are, are used in 
in training young, young and emerging managers, in, in developing the right skills. The technology courses um, and the data science courses are in high demand, but also a lot of uh, personal skill type courses um, uh, that the, the focus on speaking or business writing or, or uh, uh, presentation skills are also uh, quite viable with these employers. Um, and, and I think this is a tremendous growth area. We were inspired to do this by looking at our own data and recognizing that we had, you know, just from people using company email addresses when they registered on our platform, we had 50,000 register, you know, people registering for Coursera courses uh, from Amazon website, from Amazon email sites, and 40,000 from Cisco and so forth. So we knew there was a potential opportunity here. Um, we're also working with governments and nonprofits on workforce development. Uh, we've got about uh, nine of those arrangements so far. Um, in Kazakhstan, where they're developing Astana as a financial center, they're using Coursera courses to train uh, uh, natives to, to run basic and rudimentary financial skills so they're employable in that sector. In, uh, in Malaysia, um, the, the um, the government is helping uh, a larger cohort of young people develop digital skills for work in IT industries. In the United States, a nonprofit, the Institute, Institute for Veterans and Military Families, is using our courses in its programs to, to uh, train uh, military who are about to leave service and enter the civilian workforce. So they get courses for the last six months of their uh, of their military tour of duty. Uh, and finally, in the state of Maine, in a program I wish we could emulate in 50 states of the United States, um, uh, the state government is, is working with unemployed and underemployed individuals to give them some basic skills in both business and technology to get, to get back into the labor force. Um, Singapore, as always, is in the lead when it comes to per, uh, human capital development. And what, what they, had, they had earlier experimented with Coursera courses in, tr in just training up cadres of data scientists. Last year, they introduced a, a, a tax credit called the Skills as part of the Skills Future program. And this tax credit allows, it gives a $500 grant to any individual over age 25 who, uh, who takes a vocationally relevant course, whether, whether it, in person at one of the Singaporean universities or polytechnics, or online, uh, and over 600 Coursera courses are uh, registered for this program, and we so far have, um, have accounted for the lion's share of utilization of this Skills Future tax credit. It's actually a great idea for moving our industry ahead, and so to the extent there's open ears in Washington, we've, that's not actually very hopeful, but, we're, but uh, we're, we've been uh, trying to make our case that a similar program would be useful in the United States. Um, so what, is this, what does all this mean for the future of the university? If we were thinking initially that the university would be transformed by MOOCs, and what we found instead in the first five years is we're having a, an amazing and constructive influence on people's lives in the labor market, well, what, what, what is the spillback? What is the university going to look like in, in just a few years? My hypothesis is that this is an enabler for an expansion of the social mission of universities. And far from doing us in and replacing universities, th th this new social mission of reaching older learners at, with lifelong skills is actually going to allow us to have a greater array of programs, but just with a different mix of online and offline. So where's the university going? Let's say 15 years ago, basically, what universities did was maintain high quality undergraduate and graduate degree programs on their campuses. In the next 10 years, maybe even the next five, what we will see is universities offering, to a much greater extent, fully online master's degree programs. This is the sweet spot. It's the easiest thing. It's the easiest type of degree uh, to put online entirely. Undergraduates 
to really get the full experience of, of what an undergraduate education should be, you need some face-to-face, -face, you need some personal development, you need, you need, you know, there will be online undergraduate degrees and there'll be plenty of them, but they won't deliver nearly as rich an experience. But we think that a master's program, particularly in professional fields, can, you can come pretty close to the live experience uh, online and, and as, you, as you know, um, uh, all of the MOOC platforms are now moving in the direction of introducing online master's programs. So that's, that's first out of the box. But then I think we'll also see uh, undergraduate courses to a much greater extent than before being offered for credit that's transcriptable and transferable to other schools. So you can have people take time out, be, work on the job, not necessarily, I mean, you know, degree completion is a big issue in many countries. People leave school before they're finished. Systems like this that will allow MOOCs to serve as credit-bearing courses could really help people with that, with that, uh, with that, uh, taking that important final step. I think we'll see um, university courses offered not just in businesses and governments, but in other universities worldwide for credit. This one, I must say, has been a little slower to, to develop than I thought. Um, it, it, but, it, but I think it's inevitably going to happen, and we have a couple of instances in developing countries where it already is happening. But when you think of the task ahead for governments like India and Brazil, both of those countries have national goals of getting the gross enrollment ratio, percentage of a cohort in college, from 10 to 30 percent by 2030, 10 to 30 percent, tripling the throughput of, of uh, undergraduate education. Where are the teachers? Where is the bricks and mortar? I mean, the only answer can be online or blended uh, instances where we're where importing uh, courses from universities abroad is likely going to be a great strategy for countries like that. So I think, I think we'll, be, we'll be exporting courses to the developing world. And then finally, um, as I mentioned, we'll be, we'll be offering courses in, to businesses, to nonprofits, and to uh, government agencies around the world to help um, with the development of careers uh, and help address the skills gap uh, that is such a pervasive problem in a rapidly evolving world with rapidly changing technology. So I want to close with just one quick video. Um, this learner, uh, Hadi, is, um, is, uh, is a Syrian refugee in Turkey. And one of our, the instances of our Coursera for Enterprise offering is actually refugee camps throughout Turkey. Um, and here's Hadi's experience. Hello from Turkey. I'm Hadi from Syria, I'm a current student. My favorite course in Coursera is qualitative research methods. I would say that I don't know any one of you, but I think you are playing a very important role in this world because you are providing a high quality education for thousands of people, so you are changing people's lives. I would say we need this kind of education and I appreciate your efforts all. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be a student with Kairon and with you. We will continue learning together. We will build better will. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> do, do we want to have some questions? Carlos says we have some, a couple of questions. I think we have maybe five or ten minutes. I answered them all. Yes. Thank you for an impressive talk. You mentioned several times the paradigm of um, MOOCs to expand access and to reach populations that otherwise cannot be reached. How much do you know about social economic status 
And yes, the data on uh, developing countries are impressive, but I think you only have the, the country address to tell whether this is the national elite in the cities or in the rural areas or the poor. Do you have anything about social stratification and reach out? Uh, that's a really good question, and, and, the, and the answer, as you are suggesting, is that you know, the penetration so far has tended to be the, the high, more highly educated portions of the population, which is not unexpected given the product we're offering. Um, I do think that um, I do think that there that that that, that 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 you know we will see increasing penetration into into less highly educated people, um, but but honestly the the kinds of courses that, that w would have to be even more practical. Um, than the ones we're, that, the, that our university partners are inclined to teach. One, I mean, just to get, like 70, you know, over 70% of our learners have a college degree, which is, which is not surprising. Um, uh, although we did have enough of a sample of low-income non-college graduates in developing countries to be able to produce that statistic that I gave you. So, the, so the, while the percentages are small, the, you know, the absolute numbers of uneducated people in developing countries we're reaching it is, you know, it's tens, it's tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, not millions. Um, I, I think, you know, I think what will happen over time, and we're starting to experiment with this ourselves, because we're using, for content that is not normally taught by universities, we're beginning to use industry partners to provide Alternative. So a lot of that is mainly um, in the IT area where companies are teaching how to use their proprietary software tools, so how to be an Amazon cloud developer or, a, or an IBM cloud developer or a Google uh, uh, developer. Um, we're going to start offering courses that will, have, that will be at what you might call more a middle skills level, entry level IT jobs and things like that, which I do think will have much better chance of reaching that lower socioeconomic strata than the more rarefied material that we universities teach. Yeah. Other question? Yeah. Hi, I'm Gabby Whittles from Loughborough University. Um, it's a follow-on question about people, um, the non-traditional uh, MOOC users. We know that there's a high dropout and non-completion rate in MOOCs, but I have heard that people who don't have prior degrees tend to have a higher completion rate of MOOCs. Is that a statistic you've come across? Yeah. Hmm. I, you know, I don't know the answer. But that, I'm surprised because I usually know the data pretty well, um, as my colleagues will testify. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know what that... Uh, uh, but, um, if you give me your card afterward, I'll get you the answer. Um, the, you know, completion rates, it's interesting. The, the, if you want to get the, the I mean, the, what, the, the students who pay complete. So the ones who want the credential, completion rates are very high, above 60%. Uh, so which is, you know, uh, even, even though there's not that much money at stake. But of course, it's still true that the people who don't, who are just taking the free version of the product, they're their probability completion is still around 10%. Yes. Need a mic over here. Yeah, just go you, ahead, yeah. My name is Martin Gersing from Munich University, and uh, I was puzzled by your slide on software engineers. Mm -hmm. so I'm coming away from the social issue to the from my education issue. And I saw, well, my, my hypothesis was that most software engineers anyway have a master's degree. So the distinction with the MOOCs is that they are engaged in learning additional issues, and therefore they would be... Um, Yeah. Um, I, the, the, if you didn't hear the question, it was 
question was about that study of software engineering uh, job interviewers, job interviews. Um, and he was saying perhaps the, m most of the learners had master's degrees, most of the candidates already had master's degrees, so that wouldn't be a discriminator. And, that, that, and I think there's, so, there's certainly something to that. I, I actually don't think most have master's degree. Most have bachelor's degrees. But the, but, the, um, but the other point is, why do the recent Coursera and Udacity um, courses rate so high? To me, it's obvious. It's, it's, it's speaking about the recency of the experience and the, cur and the currency of the content. So I, th I think the reason that we that do so well is you go in, you may have gone to school six years ago, eight years ago, ten years ago. You, you go take a current course on, you know, a, a, a new programming language. I mean, I mean, we're here in Europe, Scala on the Coursera platform, for example, and you are, you are more current and, more, and, and further along than many of your, uh, 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 than the fellow students who might have gone to the same school years earlier. Um, should we move along? Okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks. Wonderful talk. So let's move on. Next speaker is Simon Nelson. He's the chief executive of Future Learn. He has uh, been spent, he has spent 14 years at BBC, where he was instrumental in putting radio online. I would uh, say that he is expert in putting things online because uh, he developed the BBC iPlayer and other crowd bending online products and services. After leaving BBC, he led a number of digital strategy and product development projects in the television, radio, and publishing sectors, working as advisor of companies including Random House, UK TV, Lime Pictures, United Business Media, and Fade and Press. He has, multi he has won multiple awards for digital education and product development, including several Emmys, Webby, BAFTA Awards, the Prix Italia, Prix Europa, and Rose d'Or. Then he was asked to uh, start Future Learn and in a very successful way. So we're looking forward to, see, to hear your insights, Simon. Thank you. Just take me a moment to get set up. Um, okay, uh, so uh, it's fantastic to be here. Um, it is uh, three years ago since my first major presentation um, as Chief Executive of FutureLearn at eMOOCs in Lausanne. And I remember very clearly um, being in my hotel room the day before, stressing terribly about uh, this uh, audience I was going to be in front of and uh, did I have the right slides for them and, and everything. And that evening I had to go out for dinner with um, the chief executives of Coursera and edX uh, and the president of EPFL. Uh, and that also was a very uh, nervous experience for me because FutureLearn was a few months old. We had only just launched our platform. I had very little data to share. So yesterday, as I sat in my hotel room stressing about my slides, and then went to dinner with the chief executives of Coursera and edX, um, I also uh, uh, I thought, OK, uh, I have some interesting perspective to share on how we have come in the last three years. The one thing I did not do uh, was what clearly I am going to have to do in future, which is sit with Rick and compare our presentations because we will say many of the same things. And to some degree, that is because FutureLearn has been very much inspired by the progress of Coursera and edX. Uh, we launched our platform two years later than them. And we have learned a lot from them. We think there are some areas where we have developed on what they're doing, and we hope to continue to do so. Um, but I decided to take one of my slides from three years ago 
and, uh, and put it forward because I said at the time that I found the debate about MOOCs very tiresome. Um, and it reminded me of my time at the BBC when uh, digital was arriving in radio and then in television. And evangelists were saying, this is the future of everything and this will replace everything. And skeptics were saying, no, no, this is a, a fad, it will be gone in a couple of years. Uh, and I couldn't believe it three years ago that this was the simplistic dialogue about MOOCs. Well, over the following three years, that dialogue has only continued. Uh, but if anything, the skeptics uh, have grown even louder, saying, oh, OK, well, MOOCs promised to change the world, and they didn't, so do they still exist? A few weeks ago, I had to uh, sit on a panel called Return of the MOOC, and I expressed the opinion uh, I wasn't aware we had even been away. Um, and I also, first slide that Rick and I share, um, is from the excellent Class Central report uh, from um, the end of last year into uh, the state of the MOOC landscape. And they are showing phenomenal growth. And this has been our experience. Things have not slowed up. Universities have not suddenly stopped uh, wanting to join us or wanting to create more. Everyone is doing more. Um, what has changed uh, is uh, not that enthusiasm, but within the university, the quality of strategic thinking about why they are doing this. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in this session. But again, second overlap with Rick. Um, I also drew from the uh, also excellent a lifelong learning report uh, done by The Economist at the start of the year. And if you have not read it, I strongly recommend you to do so. Because I think they really started to analyze the difference we are making uh, in this market. And that ability to scale uh, education uh, and take it to places it has never been before uh, is something that cannot be simply dismissed. Uh, but in addition, um, I think all of the MOOC platforms are now better at expressing exactly what Rick just did in his keynote, uh, which is our willingness and desire to work with universities to help enable them to embrace the opportunities and face the challenges of a digital world. So... Um, just to check, I, I, I like Rick very much, but this is my bottle, isn't it? Uh, this is a fresh bottle. Yes, it is. I don't think we're quite at sharing water yet. Um, so, but there is an even more urgent need for higher, uh, for higher education now to embrace this digital revolution that I believe is happening. Uh, and higher education in 2017 is facing new and complex challenges. Brexit, which of course we know only too much about, uh, where I come from, uh, is causing such uncertainty around freedom of movement and student recruitment, and it's leading many higher education institutions to recognize they have to diversify. And the time is now for them to enter the global market, and it's never been easier to do so. Funding cuts mean that many universities are very uncertain about the future of their finances. They have to look to varied revenue streams, uh, such as in the UK, the development of apprenticeship services. And the evolving job market could be a subject of a keynote on its own, but we believe that a traditional higher education pathway is no longer going to serve our workforce and the jobs of the future. Learning systems won't be able to keep up with new skill demand by 2026. As technology begins to outpace humans, creating demands from the job market, which higher education is going to have to learn to meet. And things are heating up. Just in the last few months, there have been several big deals which are making real waves in the market. And including, with a new incumbent in the uh, US White House, uh, a new renewed enthusiasm for new entrants to education 
in the for-profit sector. So um, the sort of strategic challenges facing the university are probably familiar to all of you in the sector. But I get a bit frustrated that digital development is only seen as one of these challenges alongside teaching excellence, research excellence. I think it misses the point. Because for me, a meaningful digital strategy is actually the essential tool with which a university can tackle all of its challenges. And I believe the next few years are shaping up to be a defining period for higher education institutions, with the strategic decisions made now being crucial to their future success. And I think one area where Rick and I may differ slightly is I do think that change is going to be uh, more significant and more fundamental for the core of the university, uh, but that's maybe something we can debate on the panel uh, this afternoon. Uh, and I uh, agree with uh, Thomas uh, from our newest partner, Darden Business School. That pretty much all universities need to move faster than they are. Many, though, not all, are not as prepared to admit this. And in my view, when a market moves digital, it requires a disproportionate investment in digital before it becomes as important. And it is those universities that are prepared to move aggressively into the space that can take most advantage in the future. So for me, the real story has never been about MOOCs. They're just one part of a much broader disruption, which is the arrival of the internet as a disruptive force in higher education, and one that's already having much more fundamental impacts on learners and institutions. And MOOCs were never a fad. MOOCs have been possibly the most powerful catalyst, certainly in our university partners, this is what they tell me, for driving digital transformation for their students, for their faculties, in all the other services such as marketing that they need to adopt new skills. And so I no longer position FutureLearn as a MOOC platform, but we believe we are a platform and a partnership that can act as a catalyst and enabler of the digital transformation that universities, in my view, must now go through if they are to capitalize on these opportunities and address the challenges as the industry moves more digital. So at FutureLearn, in order to help partners, we focus on the following areas as where we hope to bring value to our partners. And the first, and probably the main reason why many partners started uh, and joined FutureLearn is the ability to address new audiences and markets. So three years ago, one of the things I was most nervous about was whether anyone would ask me how many learners we had alongside Coursera. Uh, because at the time, I think it was about 150,000. We only had a beta product which had just launched at the end of 2013. So we'd missed that first wave of enrollments. Uh, it took us a year and a half to reach our first million learners. But then the next five million have come in just two years. At the time, most of our learners came from the UK. Now, three quarters come from outside. And some of our courses have now been truly massive. Well over one million enrollments to a single, to five presentations of one course from the British Council for example. In our demographics, something we've always been very proud of and has sustained over those three years is that 60% of our learners are female. We believe that is at least the inverse of other players. 40% of our learners are 26 to 45, 25% 46 to 65. And again, as with Rick, at the beginning, I used to get challenged by universities saying, but hold on, we, you're not reaching our core undergraduate population. 
But now I think they're realizing, and we are, that our real potential, and again, completely agree with Rick here, is to help universities meet the vast demand across all age groups and to rethink their role in society beyond the very tight demographic targets and education remits that they had before. We're very proud of the diversity of our learners and our ability to serve their massively varying needs. And when we get this right, the reaction of those learners is inspiring and exciting in its potential to bridge new learners into deeper learning opportunities. So secondly, our partners are attracted by the possibility of joining a new, exciting and vibrant partnership. Three years ago, we only had 20 universities, all from the UK. All of those partners have stayed and have now been joined by another 11 of the top British universities, including UCL and Durham and Manchester. Our non-university partnerships have grown significantly beyond the British Library and British Council, but we quickly expanded beyond the UK as well. I actually met the University of Basel in Lausanne three years ago, and they became a partner. And we now have nearly 40 university partners from outside the UK, including uh, in Spain, Universidad Pompeu Fabra and Universidad Competence in Madrid, plus other partners, including the European Space Agency and the International Federation of the Red Cross. And we were very proud a few weeks ago to announce our first US partnerships, including Purdue, Chicago, and Colorado State, plus one course coming from Berkeley. But it's a network of these partnerships that we're attempting to build, not just a series of bilateral relationships. So we host many events, such as this, where partners come together and share knowledge and expertise. But our hope is that we're going to start to see them move further towards collaboration in the online learning space. Because that's where we really think that you can make significant attacks on some of these skills gaps and challenges. When universities actually work together to solve some of these challenges. And we want to be at FutureLearn a catalyst for that dialogue and cooperation. Thirdly, we believe and we're constantly told by our partners that they're able to innovate further and faster on our platform and working with our people than they could with their own learning management systems, virtual learning environments, and within only their own organizations. Um, we believe we've built a fantastic platform for delivering effective learning at scale, built on social foundations. Because we identified at the beginning, while everyone in the MOOC world was obsessing about video delivery, the thing we thought was most interesting was the communities of learners coming together, learning together, and potentially learning from each other. So um, I've used a lot of PowerPoint, so I'm going to take a gamble now, which one should never do probably, and see if I can do a live demo, which uh, the tech team have uh, worked uh, very hard to try and do for me, um, of FutureLearn on my mobile. So uh, can we try to change to mobile? OK, so let me show you a bit of FutureLearn on this device. Um, so um, you can see we have uh, currently 6 million uh, people uh, who have uh, uh, signed up so far. Um, and we are promoting categories of business and management courses, health psychology, tech coding, teaching. Uh, again, uh, three years ago, we might have launched one course uh, in the week of eMOOCs. Yesterday, we launched courses on big data from the University of Warwick, digital leadership, ECG assessment, first aid for babies and children from the Red Cross. So if I go into one of these courses, we felt it was essential that everything worked on a mobile device and as well on a mobile device as on a laptop. 
Um, so uh, we have also focused very heavily on the best user experience that we can. Clean, simple, elegant, beautiful, uh, and easy for people to use. So if I just go to this course, uh, How to Succeed in the Global Workplace, uh, it started uh, a couple of weeks ago, but this is a very big course from uh, the British Council. Tens of thousands of people uh, enrolled. And if you go to the first step, it is a video step. Uh, all the video works, again, full screen. Uh, it's an introduction. But the thing that we have put most emphasis on is this. On the same page as you consume all the content, you join a discussion. And we think it is as important that people engage in these discussions as they consume the content. So this is Morgane Seru, who uh, joined the course five hours ago. She's French, living and working in Brazil. Uh, Olympia from Romania, um, lives in the UK, wants to improve her communication skills in English. Daniel from Lima joined seven hours ago. Uh, and uh, if I just uh, go through a little bit the steps, so we ask people to show where in the world they are. Uh, 1,200 uh, people have done that so far. Uh, then there is some reading on cultural identity. Uh, again, 600 comments. But then also we create specific discussion steps uh, to encourage people to engage as part of the learning design. So this asks people to discuss uh, an example of cultural differences. Uh, and again, uh, 600 people have joined, uh, uh, have uh, contributed to this. Um, and some of the stories, I just wanted to emphasize that these are not just simple, basic, one-word answers. This is really detailed, engaging, uh, inspiring uh, conversation. You can follow people, you can filter uh, to the most liked comments, and when you've done a comment, you mark you've done it and check your progress. I'll go back to my computer for now if I can. Um, so, we put a real emphasis on, um, we believe that many learning management systems still look like they were designed in 1998. Uh, and that the learning experience is made uh, worse for learners, uh, not better by the technology in many cases. Um, okay, so back to the slides, if possible. Yes, thank you. Um, so, some of this is enabled by our platform, but the platform is only as good as the content that goes onto it and the learning design that underpins it. So, I have a large team, uh, and its head is here today. Nigel, give us a wave if you don't mind, uh, and Katie, who is one of those team, um, who support our partners uh, to create great courses, to identify the right learning design, to quality assure those courses, and to try to make sure that they achieve their ambitions. And don't just take what they do in the classroom online, but reinvent it for a digital platform. And we've created a course uh, about how to make a great uh, FutureLearn course. And my team identified their favorite moments in courses, which I thought I would share with you a few of their thoughts. The exercise at the start of the Girls' Volume, Education please, course from the Girls' Day School Trust. Thank you. In this very first step of the course, learners are asked in one word to give the main reason they think that girls' achievement in school is not always reflected in the workplace. I love it because it places a controversial issue right at the start of the course, getting people thinking about and evaluating their own experiences as soon as they walk in the door. The results of the poll are presented later in the week as a word cloud so that you can see your word compared to those of other learners. This is a fascinating start to the course. What do you call a gathering of robots? That's a big question. The University of Reading produced a course called Begin Robotics, 
which started with this genuine request for crowdsourcing a new term in an emerging field. Currently, there is no commonly accepted collective noun for a group of robots in the English language. Learners contributed some brilliant suggestions, including a network, a matrix, even a swarm. Learners really got into this step. It opened the course and set the tone by getting the creativity flowing. The live video Q&A on the genealogy course from Strathclyde. The course follows Chris's journey of discovery as she researches her family tree. It's a fantastic example of real storytelling. The live Q&A gives learners an opportunity to speak directly to Chris and learn more about her quest to uncover her family history. This is a step from the Maths Puzzles course from the Weizmann Institute of Science. Early in the course, Yossi, who is one of the educators, offers a challenge from outer space that has seemingly no possible answer given the level of comprehension that most or probably all of the learners have at this stage. It's a mind-bending task, so it fits perfectly in the frame of a course about puzzles. Learners discuss the challenge and suggest possible answers, but what really comes across in this step is the excitement generated by the task. It is a brilliant way to engage learners at the start and compel them to stay to the end. By then, they may even be able to offer a solution. I love the discussions generated by the course Why the European Union from Universitat Pompeo Fabra in Barcelona. At a key moment before the UK's EU referendum vote, this course brought together some very dense material in an accessible and nonpartisan way. The discussions that I saw were very complex. Overall, they remained very respectful. And they brought together learners from across the UK, across Europe, and around the world who had different, sometimes conflicting perspectives. If only we had more civics and political science courses available before major elections. Um, OK. Uh, so as time's gone on, the need to monetize and extract greater financial return on their investment as well as the strategic returns that I've spoken about so far, has grown for partners. And we have responded. And the opportunity that we're all looking at is the ability to offer shorter, unbundled courses and qualifications for professionals. Over half of our learners on short courses are professionals who are looking to improve their skills or switch jobs. I'm sorry, that's a bit small for you. We launched a basic statement of participation a couple of years ago, but last year in May, we introduced our new certificates of achievement. Uh, we recently added an upgrade track to our courses, and this premium track provides them with access to summative assessments, uh, ongoing access to the course after it's finished, and a certificate once they're eligible. But we still make the vast majority of the course free. Though in September, we'll offer some partners in some courses the opportunity to deliver fully paid courses alongside, because we do think in certain genres, uh, such as uh, short healthcare courses, uh, this may be a better model for them. And we're trying to now more actively build a co coherent portfolio of professionally relevant courses focused in four key areas, business and management, healthcare, digital skills, and teaching. And we would like to add appropriate professional accreditation and prioritize uh, these kind of uh, areas for professionals. We also introduced programs uh, last year, collections of courses which build to more substantial qualifications for learners. And we've had some real success with these. This is a two-course program in management and leadership from the Open University, which leads to then a summative assessment from the Chartered Management Institute and accredited by them for their level five certificate. And that addition of the professional body 
and professional recognition has made this one of our most successful courses so far. And some of our partners, such as Leeds University uh, and the Open University, are offering university credit in return for completion of these programs. In this case, 10 credits towards an undergraduate degree. Now that ability to use MOOCs as a recruitment tool has developed rapidly and represents one of the key ways we can deliver significant financial returns to universities. Initially, using courses to feed into particularly master's degrees, then using programs to offer a bit of that master's degree in the open. But then, partners started asking how much further could they take this model? Could they offer multiple programs and start to break down the degree? Uh, and indeed, could they actually use this model to offer a full online master's degree? Uh, and the answer is yes, we can. So uh, a few, uh, two months ago, we launched online degrees on FutureLearn. So you can now do five full master's degrees from Deakin University in Australia entirely on the FutureLearn platform, entirely on your mobile. Uh, and I will let you navigate and have a look, please do, at how that breaks down. But you have a whole degree modularized into programs and courses. And the equally innovative thing, some of those courses are free open MOOCs, which provide the pathway into the full uh, program and then the full degree. You can pay as you go, you can just take parts of the qualification, or you can build to the whole thing in your own time. We're incredibly excited about this, and we have other partners uh, we expect to announce soon offering full degrees. Uh, but finally, um, we've also developed services that help our partners to reuse their MOOCs for their own students or for employers. So many of our universities have been using uh, MOOC-based learning alongside campus-based study. But this has been difficult for them to do and to know who their students were and to offer them a different experience. So we have built a tool which is currently in beta uh, that is supporting organizations and universities to easily manage groups of learners, potentially thousands of learners. Uh, they can invite them elegantly to join uh, the organization on FutureLearn and a page for that organization. They can recommend to them uh, open courses or invite-only courses from them, their own organization or curated from others. And then they can track the data for those individual learners or groups of learners within uh, the courses and potentially, therefore, make interventions separate from what the open, the full cohort is doing. And we think, therefore, that gives the opportunity to the university not only to take its learning out to the world, but to bring other learners, particularly professional learners, into the classroom to work alongside the current students using our social learning techniques uh, to enhance the experience. And if we look at the reasons why a university like Purdue uh, has joined FutureLearn, this is the reason they're talking about, bringing their students into a global conversation using advanced online learning. So our vision for our partners is that they can achieve many or all of these objectives if they take a strategic perspective on the value of MOOCs to their organization. And the real difference between now and three years ago is that then many partners were just putting a toe in the water, experimenting, asking which academic wanted to do a course, finding some money from here or there. Now, 
Whenever we talk to a partner, we say, what are you trying to achieve? Because we believe we can help you achieve these things that are the foundations of your digital transition. But I'm just going to end by um, emphasizing that we care deeply about our partners. We care more about our learners. And this is what really fires uh, the excellent people that work at FutureLearn. Uh, and just a couple of examples. Um, two years ago, during the uh, most recent Ebola outbreak, 18,000 people joined the first run of a course on Ebola. 3% of them came from Sierra Leone, one of the affected countries. And one of them came from a single mobile phone in an Ebola treatment center in Sierra Leone. Now, the owner of that phone emailed us to say that 40 people had actually done the course on that phone. And could they all get a uh, certificate from us? And we said yes if they sent us a photo. Um, and this ability to reach out into parts of the world that desperately need online learning is one of the things that we really want to build upon uh, and work with our partners to not only deliver them strategic value, uh, financial return, but also, as with this project, actually help the people most in need of education, refugees in Jordan and Lebanon from Syria, uh, who we can now use innovative online techniques to deliver the kind of education that has been denied to them by the horrors uh, affecting that country. Uh, so, um, thank you for listening. I, I would just end by saying we believe we're creating a fantastic platform with accessible, credible, enjoyable courses uh, which engage our learners in vibrant conversations. And we offer our partners the chance to access that community and together grow and learn uh, with us. Thank you very much for your time. Yes, uh, I think we have five minutes if anyone would like to ask questions. One at the back, I can see. Hello, good morning to everyone. My name is Nicoletta. I come from the University of Lisbon. Uh, so you mentioned a very interesting statistics um, that 60% of the learners are female. Do you have any information? Why is that so? Uh, so I think it's a, a combination of accessible platform. I think the social learning methodology is particularly uh, uh, attractive. But also, we have a course portfolio that is not so dominated by uh, technology, engineering. So we have a wider range of healthcare, teaching courses, etc. And we have spent almost nothing on marketing. Uh, over uh, these past three years. Uh, so FutureLearn has really grown uh, by uh, people recommending uh, courses and the platform to each other. That is what our research shows us. Uh, and so we believe we have um, made uh, the right uh, inroads, uh, and then it has spread among those communities. We would like to do a lot more with this advantage to try to attract, attack some of the gender skills gaps in areas like technology and engineering and are looking for the right partners who can help us try to uh, attack these challenges at scale. Because I don't think we have the same excuses we used to have for enabling this to happen. We have global, scalable platforms now where we can try new techniques uh, to address these issues. Down here. Hello, I'm Rainer Sauerborn from Heidelberg in Germany. Um, thank you very, for a very inspiring in, um, presentation. I am impressed by the emphasis you put on mobile technology. I think you stand out in the, among the other platforms. Uh, I would 
intuitive find it a little bit painful to follow an, an entire code through this little mouse screen, uh, mouse uh, size screen. Have you got any experience if people have the chance to do either, whether it's a stopgap until you get a decent screen, or is it something that people would uh, find useful on its own right? So I, I actually don't have data on um, uh, how many are using multiple screens. My instinct is that many are. Uh, so, you know, my own usage, for example, will be um, I will access on mobile, iPad, uh, computer at various different times of the day. Um, but I think that this device uh, not only opens up parts of the world like that Ebola uh, camp in uh, Sierra Leone, uh, but also uh, it offers the ability to do your future land course uh, in the bed, in bed, uh, in the bath, on the bus. Uh, and I remember when I was at the BBC, um, one of the things that, you know, the first reason why we tried to expand digital access was about ubiquity of access. It was about enabling people to fit, uh, to, uh, fit learning or media and now learning into their lives, not have to dedicate their lives to being in one place and fixed. Uh, and our belief is that the importance of this device is only going to grow, particularly in key global markets. Uh, so we built into the foundations of the platform from day one, everything had to be responsively designed. We won't let things on the platform if they break on mobile, which has been difficult with some academics who want to bring this uh, fantastic system they've developed over here onto the platform. We say, no, we want to deliver always the best experience for learners. Uh, so yeah, a real emphasis. Hi, my name is Vicky Roy from the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology in Calgary, Canada. Uh, we're going to sign a partnership with you for the School of Business uh, very soon. And um, it was interesting because I took some many course. I'm a business professor in strategic management and entrepreneurship. And mostly my MOOC was really, really uh, um, I was influenced by your platform about um, the communities. Uh, that was one of the biggest things for me. Uh, I just want to know, like, the higher percentage of your learners. It is in business and healthcare so far. What do you have, like, some stats? Uh, so we have, um, uh, I, I would say, a disproportionate uh, level in areas like healthcare uh, and across healthcare from. Uh, GP, uh, general practitioners, doctors, nurses, allied health workers, um, but also then in teaching. So we have um, quite a number, for example, of language courses, English language courses, uh, and uh, we've reached a significant global community of teachers, potentially 20% of the audience, we believe, works in education in that kind of uh, area. So those are particular uh, strengths for us. Um, but when we analyze uh, our learners as well, there are you know, a significant proportion of leisure learners, retired learners, but most are using this in some way professionally. Again, as Rick Levin was saying, you know, that is the real use case. That is where we can help transform people's lives, helping them get a job, improve in the job, be promoted, or get their next job. Uh, and that applies from teacher to nurse to doctor to social uh, media uh, analyst and beyond. Thank you. Thank you.